started. Um, this session is called Ask the Developer, and it's a very informal session. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to pass the microphone around uh, to some people who are going to just say a sentence or two about what they do. Uh, so basically, we're going to start with one person and hand it around, and if you want to say something about your expertise or what you're working on, go ahead. If not, just pass it along to the next person. As soon as we're done with that, um, anyone that has any kinds of questions about anything is free to ask their question. Um, and if we have no more questions, then we're done with the session. So again, this is very informal, uh, just here to get you guys uh, more information. Does that make sense to everyone? And this microphone is really loud, so keep it far away. I learned that lesson this morning. Hi, I'm Gabriel. Um, I've been involved in some way for a while, 2003, I think. And um, recently I've been working on Parseed and APIs. So if you're interested in those things, I'm happy to talk about it. Hello, I'm Giuseppe. And I work in the oper technical operations team for the um, Wikimedia Foundation. So basically, anything related to the infrastructure that's running Wikimedia and the other sites. You can ask me. Um, hello, I'm Tim Mateo. I currently work in the performance team, primarily focusing on MediaWiki core and front end development. Uh, hi, I'm Lego KTM. I do mainly MediaWiki things, um, core and extension development. Yeah, everything. Hi. I'm Yubi. Uh, I work in the Wikimedia Labs team uh, that hosts bots and tools that help people do things. Um, I've been involved for four -ish years and I used to work in the mobile apps team before. Is there anyone else in the audience that wants to help answer questions for now? Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Sibrand. Um, I do stuff with translatewiki.net, so if you have any questions about localization or that kind of stuff, then I can answer those. Hi, I'm Jan. Um, I, for example, do wiki data engineering and uh, continuous integration. So if you have any questions about automated tests. Okay, excellent. Anyone else? Alrighty, um, so let's hear the questions. Does anyone have anything? Um, if not, we're going to send it to Kim to start us off. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, if, if anyone came here with any specific questions, um, be, be brave and ask first. I have a question about kind of the roadmap. Um, of what you're doing. Um, so a lot of people I work with are asking for a notification and discussion system and it seems like flow is stopped or stalled at the moment. Mm -hmm. So can anyone say something about is there a replacement system at some point? Will development continue with this? Should we recommend external users to work with flow or should we not? Um, yeah, any opinions would be very welcome. So the official status of Flow is that it's stalled and like in maintenance mode, which is the same status as Liquid Threads, which is the thing we're supposed to replace. Um, I think that eventually at some point work will resume on Flow. Um, I don't have, I can't like say when management's going to be like, yes, you can work on this again. But I don't think anyone's going to build a replacement for it because. Uh, mostly because there's been a lot of work invested in Flow, and Flow has like solved some of the hard problems with discussion systems. Um, and like, if people are interested in contributing, I know the collaboration team is going to review patches for Flow and stuff. Um, so like, I think that would be a good place to get started. Um, yeah, I would not recommend using Liquid Threads because that's just asking for disaster. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I should have thought of that. It's me, but there's, there's
there's a session in Wikiminia proper uh, from the collaboration team where they are actually addressing the situation of their work and etc. So if you're interested in the future of flow, go to that session. It's I don't remember now the, the title, uh, but there's, the team will be there. Okay. Anybody? Yep. Sweet. Um, I've got a question about the templating system, the moustache templating. Um, it's been introduced uh, some time ago, and uh, as far as you can see, with uh, the 1.27 release, there are only um, two uh, templates actually used on the core. What is the future of this templating? Um, would you recommend uh, extension developers to build on this templating system, or um, w won't it be continued in any way? Uh, yeah, so over the past few years, there has been many requests from developers to adopt and embrace some kind of template system uh, for static HTML and uh, this would simplify security reviews and separation of uh, logic and uh, HTML code. Um, and we recognize this and over the past uh, release cycle we eventually um, decided to go with uh, Moustache as you, as you mentioned. Uh, this has been standardized both in the back end in PHP as well as on the client side so they can be shared which is quite nice. Um, they're primarily used in extensions, not so much in MediaWiki Core yet. Uh, so you will find that in the bundled extensions, they are used more than twice. Uh, but in MediaWiki Core, adoption has been quite slow indeed. Uh, it's not a huge priority. Things that work, we, we try not to focus on too much. Uh, it's primarily used for, for new stuff. Um, in the current release cycle, we're also starting to use it on various special pages. So the special contribution page now uses a moustache template. Um, and we'll probably continue to see more uh, adoption of that. So yes, I would, if you prefer to work with <coughs> templates, uh, there's no reason particularly to do or not to, but if that's what you, what you prefer, then I would definitely recommend stepping on that bandwagon and using uh, Moshash templates forward. Uh, at the same time, there's also the OOUI -like library, which um, is kind of similar because it uses widgets, but the main difference is that like, um, it also has like the CSS and stuff set up for it and like you can just create one widget and it'll, the, it has like themes that look different in each skin or like two skins. Cool, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, uh, more questions? You guys have questions for each other. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So, uh, in your experience, I'm interested in the first patch written by a new developer. So, that developer already has found something to do, learn how to do it, etc., and submitting that patch. Do you see any common patterns, or do you, would you have a, a recommendation that would be useful for these, uh, you know, first patches that, that you see? So, okay. so I used to run a lot of hackathons uh, a few years ago. Um, so I've run into this a few times. Um, the biggest problem was get and uh, then was get it. Because a lot of people, like at some point you're like, oh yeah, and then you just get and then you lose them. Um, because they might be writing code uh, and whatnot, but at that point you need to know a lot of stuff uh, before you can understand what's going on. Um, and people, we lose people there. And once, but there's also a group of people who have already used Git. Um, but the reality is for a lot, that there exists a large number of developers for whom Git equals GitHub. Um, and when you throw them into Git, uh, that doesn't really work. So they just bounce off. Um, so recently I adopted, a, like for the last two months that I ran, I just basically switched to not even talking about MediaWiki extensions at all and just talking about user scripts and gadgets um, because the learning curve for that is much simpler. Um, and then that only requires that you, have a, that you have a problem you want to solve and then you know the technology which is JavaScript. Um, but like for MediaWiki extensions or MediaWiki development in general, the setup cost is just so high um, that unless you have someone's full attention for, I would say, two days, 
you cannot really get them up to speed on it. Uh, the other problem we had was if you write a gadget or a user script, you can immediately show it off, um, both to yourself and to your friends, and you can, it's a thing you can share. Um, it's, you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's this thing I did, come take a look. Um, but if you submit a patch, uh, it takes a long time to get code reviewed, um, and it might take an even longer time to get deployed. Um, so that is definitely a big negative. Um, and for writing new extensions, like, like I got an extension I wrote deployed when I was a volunteer and that took only two years. Uh, and so that was like, yeah. So I think right now as it stands, if you are running a workshop, I would recommend not using, like not even attempting to get people to hack on MediaWiki. Just hack on all the things on top of it. Um, but yeah, I don't really know how we can get around Git. <laughs> Um, there are various ways you can make GitHub a usable interface because they have a lot of documentation and culture around it. So even if they haven't like used the way we do stuff, they, there is like the number of people who know get it is a tiny fraction of the number of people who know how to use GitHub. Um, so I think that is important. Uh, but other than that, I'm not really sure what we can. But there's nothing wrong with working on gadgets and tools and all the other things with lower barriers to entry. MediaWiki extension development is not the only way for you to contribute. Um, so we should also focus on doing all this other stuff and not be like, oh yeah, we wish we could do that, but we could have to do this instead. No, this is also valid by ourselves. Um, for getting people to contribute to like MediaWiki extensions and core, um, I think like what I typically recommend people do is like install Vagrant and like do that a few hours in advance. And then once they have Vagrant, um, it's documented very nicely all on one page, um, which is like very easy to read through. Um, and it, Vagrant also like auto configures Git and Git review for you, so like that's much easier. And people, it's harder for people to screw up, um, and you know exactly what their environment is, so you can provide much better debugging support. Um, and then the last thing is to like have them find someone they can nag on IRC about their patch, um, which is probably the best way to get code review. So that is one of the other problems, which was getting people on IRC. Uh, but or more importantly getting them to stick on IRC because like if I do a workshop I get people on IRC and they're like oh yeah this is cool and then they just like close their client on their desktop and then never come back because it's not a thing they use for anything else um, so yeah that's that's also a because like as you said like if you don't if you're not on IRC if you just submit your patch to get it it's basically gonna lie there forever um, we have no means of support for even telling people oh yeah you should add these people as reviewers no it's just going to be there forever. So that's also a big barrier. Yeah, I have two points that I, that I see when I see new patches. So one is more about the code structure of MediaWiki core itself. Like, is it obvious about wh where to find a piece of code that controls the thing you want to try and change? Um, I think we've made a lot of improvements there with our code documentation on MediaWiki.org and the auto generated documentation as well. That made it now a lot easier to find things. Um, but then, yeah, li li like uh, Yubi and, and Lego mentioned, like th then you get to the point of how do you get it to into Garrett? Um, and I do see a lot of struggle there, like finding a way, like how do you actually push it into Garrett? Uh, Vagrant does make that a, um, a lot easier, but it takes several hours to really uh, set up, so that can be kind of um, a hurdle there. Um, with regards to code review, um, I would say uh, it depends on where you contribute. MediaWiki Core doesn't really have a group of maintainers for the entire core, so there's no proactive review much, right? You push the patch and like, like you mentioned, like then you don't really get a reviewer assigned to you. But if you maintain to an extension, I would say it's getting more and more common these days where there are a set of maintainers who look after new patches in that area. Um, and also with the Git review is bot, in MediaWiki Core, there's certain areas where that happens as well. Like I can be reasonably certain that if I um, submit a patch that gets, a, that gets Aaron added as a reviewer, he will probably look at it uh, within a day or less. Um, and I think that's something we should adopt more, more widely and actually get a sense of ownership. Because that's kind of the, the, the GitHub model where if I submit a pull request, that's the end of my first step. I know that someone will look at that because it's in the list. The list is discoverable. Him and other people can see that list um, and, 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 and make patches to it and all that. Uh, and on Garrett, we kind of missed that model where you can say, okay, what are the open patches for but that, that, that I can work on? That's not really obvious. Um, I think you advice advised to look for things outside core is a good one because the stakes are just way lower. You can scratch your itch 
and get something going and have very low risk while doing so and you don't have to fight with or find somebody to review a potentially high risk change to a core piece of MediaWiki. So and that's with all the APIs and so on that we have now, you can actually do a, ver a lot of stuff on top of those APIs. So I think that's a very fertile ground and it's also one that where you can transition from being a gadget writer uh, where you consume APIs to writing a service, for example, that run, runs in labs uh, and get a lot done that way that is directly useful. Yeah, I have a question that uh, I think you might find interesting to answer. Um, the MediaWiki code base is, uh, is getting to be uh, quite mature. It's uh, definitely adolescent at the moment. Um, we have a lot of uh, legacy code. What would you change in MediaWiki if there were no limitations? The fact that you can do too many things with Wikitext, personally, so that like rendering a complex page requires an incredible amount of computing power and it's always complex. I mean, we have a lot of basically hacks and a, a big infrastructure around the fact that parsing a page is very, very expensive. If Wikitext wasn't too incomplete, like it is, and people couldn't do all the crazy things that you can do with Wikitext, and we had to, to add extensions of things to do specialized things that people need to do in editing, that would make all of our infrastructure so much simpler and so less buggy than it is today, that, that would be invaluable in my opinion. Kill all the global variables. <laughs> Well, I think the, the wiki text bit might be hard to undo by now, yeah, now that we have <laughs> terabytes of wiki text history. <laughs> if we could, that would, would be nice. <laughs> In a better universe. Um, yeah, I think also um, having better interfaces between layers. Right now we have a lot of mixing between um, direct access to the database and um, there's no clear separation and, and no security boundaries either. For example, a lot of code currently still has access to um, password hashes. Even thumbnail scalers have access to password hashes. It's scary. And um, we, we're working on fixing those bits and pieces by pulling, pulling stuff out. But um, we, it is a challenge to keep, still keep it accessible, like you have this menagerie of services eventually and you still have to make it easy to install it and to uh, and install it on a very small virtual machine and don't lose a lot of developers who, for who current MediaWiki is actually doing exactly what they want. I agree with Gabriel. The, point, the problem is here is of course that you want to support both Wikimedia, uh, I mean, the Wikimedia wikis that are very big, and people just installing MediaWiki to do some documentation for their own project, their volunteer project. And of course, the kind of requirements and the needs are very different, and we should have a better interface. I mean, the interfaces are get, get, getting quite good at separating the two, the two use cases, but it's not perfect, let's say, right now. So yes, the problem is, of course, it's not easy because we have these two very different use cases that we should keep in mind every time. So that, for example, uh, a simple MediaWiki installation should do, be, be able to scale images directly on with one PHP file on the same machine where everything is running, including the database. And on the other end, you want people that want something more rich or more complex to be able to d delegate that completely to us a third third party service that has no access to the database, for example. So it's... Would, would part of the solution be to make a Wikimedia exclusive fork of MediaWiki? Can you repeat the question? Uh, so the question that Cipran made was, wouldn't this be solved by, by making a Wikimedia specific fork of MediaWiki? I would say 
in some ways, yes, but it would create, in, I think it would create more problems than it would solve, but I'd let the developers answer. <laughs> I'll answer that question by, by, by stating no, what I want to add, which is very similar actually, which is that I, I'm not so much necessarily a fan of using services. I think services are a correct implementation, but they're not themselves the solution. They can be part of the solution. The solution really is to have logical boundaries within the code, um, which can, at a large scale, in, in, mean that you will delegate those classes to a service. Uh, but you can just as well implement those interfaces with pure PHP like we used to do. And even if we just do that, it will already look so much better than what we have today. Um, so if you have a logical class in code, rather than, so rather than the database being your API, you have a PHP interface that is your API. And whether that class happens to access the database or something else is up to the image implementation. Um, and this sort of pluggability and modularity is slowly getting more common in MediaWiki, but it's still sort of, it's not really there yet. Um, but, but the first big chunk that has been done recently is, for example, with uh, Off Manager, where the interface is completely code-based rather than based on uh, database fields or table names being the API. Um, and this will make it easier to scale things up from there as well by allowing implementations to be swapped with other interfaces. Um, and I would like to see that happen for other parts as well. For example, for our, re for our revision storage, we're doing something similar with our external storage. That was sort of the first real case where that happened. Um, and seeing more of that go over HTTP would be quite interesting. Because right now we have several services, but they're very rarely actually consumed by MediaWiki Core itself. It's more for outside uh, consumption. But it would be interesting to see like, how would we structure things if we would start accessing REST base from within MediaWiki to fetch the wiki text content of a page. Like if, what, what would it require to get to that stage and do we want that and, and what, what would that all entail? That would be quite interesting. Yeah, I agree that, that you can do a lot by structuring the code. Um, you basically get all of the scalability, team scalability, and, and not stepping on each other's foot and so on. But what you don't necessarily get is uh, isolation, fault isolation. Because if you have that bug, it can be behind a nice interface, but it will stay, still throw an error. So that is one thing where you uh, where services help you, but on the other hand, then you have a distributed system to, to manage. So it's not free. So since there are no rules in this session, does anyone in the audience want to answer that question as well? Um, because yeah, it's not, these aren't the only guys that can answer anything. Or does anyone else have, well, let's start with that. Does anyone want to add their own opinion? Um, just a, a side note, um, I think People that are using MediaWiki outside of the foundation are using it. Uh, one main motive for them to do so, motivation is they are running the system that runs Wikipedia. So any kind of forking, um, in my opinion, will severely damage MediaWiki and its reputation. Um, so um, but we're having this discussion in the stakeholders group as well. And uh, as far as I can see, a lot of people agree that a fork is not an option. Um, and we should see that, as you said, Giuseppe, that um, outside users and um, yeah, the foundation come to a, a common agreement of how we can structure the code so both parties can work on that. I think we also need to solve some of the same problems for our own reasons, and that is to de support developers, because you don't want to uh, need a huge machine to just develop for, for MediaWiki. You want to have something that's slim, doesn't use a lot of memory. So we need that anyway. And um, I think if we don't try to do the very, very lowest end, like shared hosting, for example, if we do cheap virtual machines, I think then that's doable. At least doable as in vagrant doable. Yeah, I actually have a question for you somehow, which is how many inst levels of usage there are between, you know, a single very simple documentation project and Wikipedia's. I mean, there are a lot of spectrum going on in, in, in between and I, I don't really ever feel how many people would be interested in doing, in implementing at least part of the things that we have to do. Like, 
doing, I don't know, for example, image scaling separately or having uh, an API interface with REST-based, which is surely uh, better for some users, or, um, I don't know, having, using Visual Editor as well on, on their wikis. I mean, if it's a project that's, that's between the single small organization and the huge top 10 website, how many people there are that are doing that? Because for those kind of people, probably would be interesting to have a easier way to manage things than just going through our puppet code base to see how we're doing things. And I have to say we suck at documenting this intermediate level step and we should probably work on that. I mean, the work you, you Gabriel did with um, the container-based installation, that's great, but it's good for if you want to run it as a, as a developer, if you want to do, if we want to do something that medium, medium sized organizations could use, we should probably elaborate on that and do something that it's easy to install, still easy to install, but a little bit more powerful than just a, a classical LAMP installation on uh, hosting run. And I don't, don't even have, I don't really have a feeling of how many people are in that middle terrain between the small, the small, the very small installation and the huge one. And I don't know if you know that from the st stakeholders. Uh, so we don't have exact figures about that, but um, there's a page called Wiki Apiary, um, and they collect, they count 25,000 um, active uh, wikis. That includes the foundation wikis. Let's say the foundation wikis are 1,000, which is probably a high number to guess. Um, then we still are tw have 24,000 active sites out there. Um, and when it comes to active users, um, I think we have about 10 million active users in those wikis. That's what these pages count. They, they look at the statistics pages of those wikis. Um, when it comes to the, your question, who is willing to help, um, we are just in the process of incorporating as stakeholders and we want to um, raise money and actually spend money on people or resources on developing things. And um, ideally, that is not only improving the installer, but maybe um, working on, as you said, on, on aspects of the core as well, um, when we found a way of working together. Um, on the other hand, one of the more frustrating things is if you start a project outside and, and you don't cooperate with the foundation developers, your chances are not very high to get stuff in. So, um, and when once money is involved, we need some kind of, not a guarantee, but we're working up with some kind of um, memorandum of understanding, which we probably work on together, I think, with the developers at the foundation, uh, so that we can have a bit more clarity of what is our scope and what can we do in, as a stakeholder. But as I said, there's a lot of willingness and it's getting more concrete than it was before, so we're actually planning our first ideas and projects now, and we have resources for that, probably, very soon. I just want to make a small comment on what you mentioned be uh, having a guarantee. So often when it comes to larger features, it, it requires some kind of product, um, product perspective, which is hard to get a guarantee on as from outside the foundation. But when it's about technical implementation that wouldn't affect the product very much, then I think an improved RFC would be the best way to go for that. Because um, then from that point forward, you can have all the leeway you need to implement it um, uh, without hitting a struggle later on by saying it's not good enough or it's not the way we want it. Um, so that will be the process for that. Did that answer your question, Mark? Okay. Um, anyone have? So the services uh, things have one thing that uh, many wiki extensions only recently acquired that is declaring their dependencies. So that's not much used for extensions yet, but I hope it will be because it will make testing and installation easier because you can verify that you actually have around what you need. Um, and it would be good to have the same thing for services, to be able to declare, okay, I want to uh, have a media key installation with these things, and for that I need this and this and this service. Yeah, 
these services have tests, and those tests exercise dependencies typically. So that's an implicit way to, to kind of um, declare that they need it because the tests would fail if they weren't there. But um, in, in the sense, and there's documentation. Um, but yeah, how do you declare dependency on a remote service in a way that can be checked automatically or something? That's, um, how do you have ideas? So one way to declare them currently is uh, if you were to run the whole thing in Kubernetes to use uh, the format that Kubernetes uses. Um, another way would be to, and when the new uh, JSON or YAML structure to just formally um, give unique names to services and not declare anything more like I don't know uh, on what IP address it is hosted or something because that can be done elsewhere but to only list the actual dependency not the concrete one I agree, that's a good point. I think Kubernetes, as it is just getting ready to, to uh, cover a lot of these use cases, I think that's, it, it's set to solve some of the problems that, that uh, Giuseppe also mentioned about the mid-scale part. Because right now, this, the thing that I did with the MediaWiki -E containers thing is basically just a, a, sh a shell script. It's not very uh, sophisticated. And uh, Kubernetes would actually let you declare these dependencies and then um, distribute things, move from one machine that is just a minimal setup to multiple machines and uh, just declare these service dependencies at a high level. So I think Kubernetes is the wrong choice for what you asked for, uh, which is to explicitly declare dependencies for services, right? Um, and Kubernetes, if you actually look at the spec format, you cannot do that. You cannot say, I don't want this pod to come up until this service is ready. There is no explicit dependencies. Um, that's like, if you look at the underlying core of how Kubernetes does these things, it runs in a reconciliation loop. Uh, so the way they say, like, so this is a common question, right? Like, hey, my database is coming up, or my microservice is coming up, and if this comes up before that, it will contact it and fail. Uh, so the canonical answer right now is basically like, well, you should retry, or if it fails, it should die, and Kubernetes will start back up. Uh, so I think there is actually no real way of doing this. Like Kubernetes is like it's just all implicit. There is nothing explicit there at all. Uh, so while I agree that like a Kubernetes version of the Docker stuff is useful, that would not actually help you. Um, it might help you in setting up the services in an easy way, but it is not going, you cannot find out what, like you can't draw a dependency graph from the Kubernetes setup. So you need to make your own thing for it anyway. But for networking restrictions, you need to know which service needs to be able to access which service. So at that point, you have declared, implicitly declared some dependencies. Uh, so, network, so network isolation is not a direct part of Kubernetes. It's a plugin that you can use if you use uh, Calico. And uh, even there, so at that point, you are basically writing a second level of stuff. Um, and even, so that, that and then, so, so that's not a real Kubernetes thing. And at that point, you're operating at a different level. And even then, you're only doing ACLs. You're not doing dependencies. Uh, because I think dependencies imply ordering. And ACLs do not apply ordering. Um, so yeah, you can you can infer things from all of those things, but I think there should be like an explicit way to declare what you ask for, and I don't think such a thing exists at the moment. Okay, I think that for small to medium uh, installations, elaborating on the work that Gabriel has done with just a simple shell script. I mean, we are never going to tell you to, to run curl and URL pipe sh. But uh, a well done shell script, like I, I, I mean, took a look at the work Gabriel has done, it's, it's very easy to set up uh, a MIDI wiki installation with Visual Editor, Parsoid, and everything working with that. And it's probably easy to make it so to, to tweak what you, you did, I mean, I mean, just pouring some of our time in it to maintain it and make it better to the point where uh, a common uh, 
any system administrator can just run the script, answer some questions uh, about what's the URL of a container if it's doing an installation that is more than one machine, and have MidiWiki and all the containers related to that, just using containers to, to run. And Kubernetes is a second level, in my opinion. And also, I have a kind of a political uh, perplexity about uh, advising people to use Kubernetes, and this is why. In doing a Kubernetes installation by yourself on your own hardware is kind of complex ish. And that is already an entry level that's kind of high for the people that just want to have an easy way to install MediWiki and use it in a middle, to, in a low to middle level. Um, so what this, these people would end up doing is using Google Compute Engine or AWS, uh, probably Google Compute Engine that gives you Kubernetes natively. And I'm not sure that I'm very happy to suggest people to use GC in general to, like, you want to run a wiki with Visual Editor? Yes, do it on GC, it's not what we want to do. Uh, so yes, probably the two things could be complementary. So for a medium to small dimension thing, probably people would want a, a, a bash script or something that does the installation for them. That one you, you did, I think it was, a, I, I really loved it when it, it, it took a look. For slightly larger installations, probably we should document what we're doing with Kubernetes once we get there, for the parts we get on Kubernetes, and for the rest probably do some more documentation for that. But I, I would advise against just going with one specific technology that is kind of complex as a base for installing with wiki, for the general public at least. So I agree that the current installation scenario for Kubernetes is uh, really bad. Uh, but they are rewriting it completely because they started off with how he suggested with like, oh yeah, let's write a well written shell script, but then the shell script got out of control um, as shell scripts do and now at some point they're like, why did we even think this was a good idea and they're now rewriting the whole setup in ways that are understandable to normal human beings. Um, but yeah, like eventually you're going to be like, if you want a, oh yeah, I just want a Kubernetes setup or my media installation, the answer is always going to be Google Computer Engine is going to be the easiest way to do it because they have the resources to make that happen um, while others don't. But you know, someone could start a Kubernetes farm that's specifically for running media instances and do that. That's never been tried before, has it been? <laughs> I don't remember exactly, but I read the, the Kubernetes tutorial and I think it was pretty agnostic. So as long as you have a root and a host or more than one, it's simple to so they don't install work. Kubernetes. It's a very simple documentation, but it doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, there's lots of documented uh, clear ways to install Kubernetes and most of them don't work uh, because lots of them were contributed by third parties and a lot of them were pre 1.0 um, and they also miss important but useful details like, oh yeah, if you do this, it will only really work on one node forever until you completely destroy it and start it back from scratch again um, and other fun aspects. So yeah, there's lots of really like good seeming documentation but uh, most of it does not work. Um, they are aware that this is a problem. Um, the, the, this has bitten them many, many times as well. Um, and they are, like, they have invested significant resources in fixing this to be not a problem in the future. But, yeah. I think it's, it's clear that it's pretty early days still. Um, but I think also a lot of stuff is moving in that direction. So I think the, the amount of companies offering this out of the box, for example, it's probably going to increment soon, so um, I'm not too worried about that. Um, I think it's also important to consider that like, even if we have one blessed installation method, people are still going to want to do it their own way. So like, even if we have like maybe containers or this awesome shell script or Debian packages, you know, people are still going to want to install it in their preferred way. Um, and so we should make sure that like, we still support those kinds of ways of installing. Like saying like you have to use the specific format is still not going to work for people and they're going to invent their own ways to install it and then we're back in the same problem. 
Yeah, I agree completely because I get as as a, a technical operator when I get just the aim to use a script, I get enraged because I, I can't do that. So, of course, you, you, we have to maintain that. But I mean, for people that don't want to think too much about it, it should be an easy way to do it, even to configure maybe we can, especially. Yeah, and especially if you get back to those uh, medium-sized organizations. Um, if they happen to be on any environment other than Google Compute Engine, like let's say they're in AWS, are they going to install Kubernetes just to run MediaWiki? That's the point. Right? Or if we happen to be in some kind of container and they run something else, like, so it, it's, it's an easy one for if you're just getting started and you don't have any other services yet. But especially if you're a medium sized organization, you probably already have an environment set up and you just want it to fit in. So I would expect the majority of webmasters to probably end up writing a puppet ship or a shell script or a chef uh, recipe to, of their own and just follow simple instructions that these, these are the requirements, this is how you set it up. And there are automated ways that we've pre-done for you, but you should be able to do it yourself as well. Did that answer your question pretty well? Okay. Does anyone from the audience have anything to add on that? Um, okay. Any other questions? We have about 15 minutes left in case we want to use up all the time. Go in once. Oh. Can, can someone tell me how Wikitext got to where it was? Like, that, that not have been an accident. Uh, the story is that Eric Muller asked Tim Starling to um, add default values to parameters and from there people were able to implement like the QIS templates because once you have like a conditional system and then people just got worse. <laughs> from from that platform where we got hidden struct and then it went downhill from there. And the, the far favorite topic since 2003 or so has been writing a proper puzzle with lots of people writing in context tweet grammars and, and things like that, which was a lot easier back then actually. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it never happens really. So now we, now we have Parsley, which is actually pretty decent, I think. So. Uh, I just hope that we don't add more to it. That is my my real hope because the cost of maintaining you can never take it back it's saved forever you will have to parse it forever or you, you break old existing content and just to get back at an earlier point about service separation uh, one thing that I would also like to see different in MediaWiki uh, if we could fix uh, if, we, if we could ignore any existing breakage is to have a really proper separation between page content and skin uh, for frameworks, so that it would be really trivial to have a skin service run separately in front of your caching layer rather than behind it. So right now we basically run the, script, run the skin within the page content, which creates a very difficult scenario of caching. Like I very often see when you have smaller wikis, they enable static file caching because they don't want to run a separate uh, proxy. Um, but then whenever anything changed in the skin at any point or they added an extension to the wiki that has an extra link in the sidebar. Now your cache is completely wrong and it takes a long time to roll it over or you have to start validating things or, um, and there's no expiry by default for static cache. Uh, so there, these, these things get really complex. Whereas if the skin was just a simple layer that is cheap and static around the page content that just can just run at runtime with no issues, um, that would get a lot easier. No, you're not. <laughs> and it's only getting worse with Wikidata. Um, that is actually <laughs> 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 tracking those dependencies is interesting. And if you, if we can at least um, avoid some of those dependencies to be tracked and pull in some data dynamically, <laughs> I mean, I know it's not possible in all cases, but in some it is. Then uh, I think we're in a better place, a less crazy place. Getting back to the earlier part of it, um, maybe we want to always version the data we store so that we actually can 
drop uh, support for parsing old variants. You run into the problem then that people still want to see old revisions of pages and you need to be able to parse and format those, which means you still need the code to parse and format those and so on. Yeah. yeah we did actually convert to UTF-8 at some point, if you consider that a change, and that it also replaced HTML entities, so it was actually a, a change that resulted in visible diffs. Um, so there's precedent for that. Um, but it's a very conversion script. Yes, yeah, the, I the, that. yeah, it was a very sophisticated way. We just dumped the database, <laughs> ran, ran some full script over the entire dump, <laughs> and re-imported the converted uh, dump <laughs> as SQL. Fortunately, it, it actually still was valid SQL. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it is not impossible in, in theory, but in practice it's a very high bar since uh, it's a big data set. And, um, Replacing all that in a in a correct way is, is pretty hard. So um, yeah, I don't think if we can avoid introducing minor features that we discover three months later that was a bad idea. That to undoing that is more work than thinking a little harder and avoiding it maybe in the first place. Good. I have a question. You mentioned you need to parse the old revisions and so on. However, uh, most of them are already broken because they contain templates which have been deleted, they contain other things which basically break the rendering. It can be even like a global style sheet or whatever. So we already did partially destroyed the old content and uh, backward compatibility in this particular case is really like a big stone ball chain to your legs and uh, with this I would actually like to ask uh, what's your position on backwards compatibility at all but uh, in this particular case I think it would be worth rather to break the old content and maybe one day in future transfer it to the new uh, code or whatever. But then we can actually focus more on, uh, on developing uh, things without having to care about the backwards compatibility which actually slows down the development and uh, ne uh, ask us or, or force us to do things which we don't want to do but we have to because we keep the compatibility. So the question basically is what's the level of the backwards compatibility which is same for both parts like developers on the one side and the users particularly the users who would use the old revisions and so on. Thanks. Okay, the simple answer that I can give in general, and it's not just for uh, Wiki, Wiki, Wikipedia, but it's for any project out there that's on the web, is that backwards compatibility is forever. I mean, it's well on software, with software you can break backwards compatibility, with websites you can't, really. Either you convert all the old con con content that we did once with this brilliant method that I, kind of, I didn't design, uh, I mean, um, apart from, either you do that, so you convert everything you had before, or you really can't, I mean, uh, if you think of how the web is constructed, it's resources, right? So every resource that you have should be either valid or redirect something that's valid. You can't really think of breaking compatibility with your old resources. Either you remove them and manage that. I mean, even in commercial projects, Whenever you do a change of URLs because some new CEO wizard tells you that's going to make you more visible to Google, which is usually not true, you still have to find all your old URLs and manage the rights to the new URL scheme. And in our case, it's even, more, it's even different because we, we actually want to serve users. We're not, we, we can't really think of 
doing a disservice to users. So even we convert what we had in the past, if we decide to break compatibility, we have to convert what we had in the past. And I'm not sure it's even, even feasible in the general case. That's why it's different to manage a website and manage a software alone. We also have to manage a website, not just a software. For the software, it could be easy. I mean, we decide that some feature is deprecated and old and toxic and we can just throw it away. But for uh, the wikis that we run, we can just do that. And I think that's the same for a lot of our organizations that are using the wiki. So it's, I, I don't think it's really feasible in the general case to break backwards compatibility on the web. I think it's also a balance between like usage, like uh, if you want to kill some obscure parts of feature that no one ever used, then you can do that, you know, but if you want to like change the way tables are made because it's super like terrible, like it, the usage for that is way too high, um, so unless you have a way to like automatically convert everything, um, it, it's just not going to happen and you have to, you, you still have to have some kind of backwards compatibility support, like regardless. I think technically it has become a lot more feasible actually now that we have a tool that can parse it and can also convert it back to something that's maybe cleaned up in a more systematic way than doing regex replacements or safer way than regex replacements. Um, but yeah, there's still a high cost about diffing. I think it's currently our diff format directly looks at the wiki text. So if we made major changes to that, it would change what people see in those diffs. And that in turn would also currently at least change what how you attribute content to people potentially. And so we have to keep those things in mind. It's, I, I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. If we have a good reason to make a major change, uh, we could find a way, I think, to still preserve um, attribution and uh, if we had a different diff mechanism, uh, <laughs> then, then maybe. <laughs> Maybe it would also not be such an issue, big issue if the syntax changed. So if we had an HTML-based thing that popped up bubbles and told you semantically, whatever, uh, somebody changed the link here from that to that, you don't care what the syntax was underneath because you don't see it. Um, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that my point was that it's it's not like we can't grow backwards compatibility. It's that it comes with a big cost, huge cost in some cases. So it's true that being backward compatible is expensive for us, but maybe breaking it could be even more expensive. So there might be reasons to do that, but it has to be a very compelling reason to do that. So when Lua was introduced as an alternative to crazy template hacks, was there ever the hope that that would replace existing? Like, did any? I, I feel like there was briefly an initiative to actually go through and 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 abolish some of the old crazy templates and replace them with Lua. Is there? Did I misunderstand that, or is that an initiative that never went anywhere, or what's happening with that? Well, currently, Lua's. Um, processing model is still to produce wiki text. So I think that's the main issue and that, that basically means that it's just a, a glorified way to, a nicer way to produce wiki text. And um, if there had been a different way to directly produce something like saner HTML or so, I think that, that would have been a different situation. But um, it was mostly, at the time, it was primarily a performance thing. So it was not meant to be the revolution and cleanliness in templating, but it was just to address, address a very particular problem. There was that Obama, Barack Obama page took, whatever, 25, 30 seconds to load because it was full of citations and each citation had a, um, a citation template and the citation templates had huge complexity, a lot of different types of citations that were supported and so on. So, I don't remember the figure exactly because I, we, we, we got it out when we were using the Barack Obama page to uh, benchmark the PHP environment when we moved to HHVM. But I think it's more than 100,000 
different templates that are called recursively by all the things that are used in that page, which is, if you look at it, it's incredibly simple. I mean, if you just look at the HTML, you say, how is it that possible? Because it's simple. But it's more than 100,000 different templates that we have to find and render recursively. So it's, yeah, it's definitely out of control, but. I think if we talk about better templating, I think the one of the big wish list items that a lot of people have is well balanced templates so that you actually can make sense of this is one item I put in there with Visual Editor and it didn't affect random parts of the page. And when I save it, it actually looks the same way. It's actually WYSIWYG. And there's a lot of things that are connected to that, like more efficient updates. We spend an awful lot of CPU cycles on re-rendering entire pages when one template in there has changed. And just so that we have the proper rendering. And if we knew this was just one HTML bit that was modified, we could actually be a lot more efficient about that. We could just go in and replace that bit of HTML and not touch anything else. So that's, that is, the, re the passing team is discussing ways to do that, um, but it's going to be some way to get there because we, that's again, we have use cases that we need to still support, like these tables that are made out of a start template, row template, and template. We have to have a replacement for those, um, for that use case. So we're thinking about, this is really data again, Wikidata, we could maybe move that list of footballers to Wikidata and not do crazy converted date to an H thing in, in, in Wikitext. Um, but then you have to have a widget that displays a table based on Wikidata information, for example. We don't have that yet, but it would be awesome to have, I think. Okay, we have two minutes left. That hour went by pretty quickly, actually. Um, does anyone have anything they want to say in two minutes, or should we wrap it up? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for coming to the session. I hope it was helpful for everyone. Thank you guys very much.